Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Freunde des Ambos Studientelegramms, Markus at home welcomes Professor Laurent Bertoletti in St. Etienne, with whom we would like to discuss cancer associated thrombosis, CAT. Laurent, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation and for being our guest tonight. Professor Laurent Bertoletti is a chest physician, head of the vascular department of the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Saint Etienne. His major field of clinical and academic work is the fight against pulmonary vascular diseases, particularly pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension. My comrades are Sarah Morell from Frankfurt, Germany, and Marlies Landlanger from Linz, Austria. Again, Laurent, we're so happy to have you. Danke, Gunnar. It's my pleasure to be with you today. So um, I will want to first thank you all for the great invitation. And it's really my great pleasure to be with you and to discuss about this topic, which is very important for us in clinical practice. First, and this is the most formal um, slide, I am the elected chairman of the Pulmonary Embolism Assembly in the European Respiratory Society, which is a huge society involved in the care of respiratory disease. And I have to declare that this presentation does not endorse the European Respiratory Society. Here are my disclosure for the five past years, and you will have to know that I was involved in most of the trial I will discuss today. So here are the four learning objectives I want to share with you. The first question would be, what do I need to know as a medical doctor in cancer-associated thrombosis management? The second question is, what do I need to know if I was, and this is not the case, a nephrologist in cancer-associated thrombosis management? What do we need to do as clinical researchers involved in the care of patients who may develop cancer-associated thrombosis? And the most important question for me is the final one. Why will I love my stay in Saint-Étienne as a German or Australian vacationer? So more seriously, what do I need to know as a medical doctor in cancer-associated thrombosis management? First, and this is one of the sole epidemiological slides. This is very easy. 20 is the gold number in cancer-associated thrombosis. As you can see on the left part of the slide, if you take into account all the patients with venous thrombolism, I will call that VTE, one in five have VTE in the setting of cancer, so cancer-associated thrombosis. On the right part of the slide, you can see that among patients with cancer, 20% of them have cancer-associated thrombosis, acute or chronic cancer-associated thrombosis. And this is explained because if you have cancer with chemotherapy or targeted therapy, you have an increased risk of VTE of 20 times. So 20 is the goal number in CAT. Unfortunately, you will also see that CAT patient does not have a poor, a good prognosis. On the left part of the slide, you can see that among patients with VTE, those with CAT have a four times higher risk of death during the follow-up. And unfortunately, on the right part of the slide, you can see that even in patients with cancer, those with cancer-associated thrombosis have a two times higher risk of death during the follow-up. And so, if you have a clinician involved in the care of venous thrombolism, if you have a patient with CAT, he knows that it will not be a good thing for the patient. And if you are an oncologist, you also know that among two patients with cancer, the one with CAT have unfortunately a worse prognosis than the one with only cancer, if you explain, express me uh, to say that. Why this patient have a worse prognosis? It is because we have very difficulties to treat them. In fact, cats 
are a therapeutic challenge. This is now since two decades, thanks to Paolo Plandoni and all the Italian networks, and they were able to demonstrate that under anticoagulant therapy, and this was VKA at these times, patients with cancer have three times higher risk of VT recurrence despite under anticoagulant therapy. And on the right part of the site, you can see that patients with cancer have a 2.5 increased risk of major bleeding under anticoagulant therapy. So we know that this patient need anticoagulant therapy. They may have recurrent VT despite anticoagulant therapy, but also they have an increased risk of bleeding because of anticoagulant therapy. And so that's why there, this is a terrific challenge for us. Please, I will stop you one minute for an educational purposes. If you give anticoagulant therapy for acute VTE, this is not the same that if you give anticoagulant therapy for AF. Despite you will use the same drugs, you do not treat the same disease. And this is explained by this arrow, the blue one. As you can see, when patients have acute VTE, the main issue is to avoid initial VT recurrence because patients will die from fatal PE, and this is the risk during the first time of treatment. So when you give anticoagulant therapy for an acute VTE, you really want to avoid very initial VT recurrence because you know that this initial VT recurrence will induce a worse prognosis in the patient. This is exactly not the same when you give anticoagulant therapy for prim primary stroke prevention in patients with AF, for example. So please remember that when you give anticoagulant therapy for acute VT, this is exactly not the same thing that you give anticoagulant therapy for patients with AF. This is also why when we decided to develop DOACS, direct oral anticoagulant therapy, we have two dis we had sorry two distinct strategies. Some companies try and succeed to develop DOACS with an increased initial dosage. And you can remember that for rivaroxaban, this is 50% increase during 21 days, while for apixaban, this is 100% increase during seven days. This increase initial therapy is very important because it is what protect patient from initial VT recurrence. Other compounds did not try to play with the avail, as we say in France, and they prefer to use low molecular weight heparin for the first days of therapy, five or seven days. And once we have the very, very risky initial period behind us to, con to compare their DOAX, edoxaban or dabigatron, versus your original therapy, which was BK at this period. So please remember that the very first day for the treatment of acute VT are crucial to protect patients from fatal events, including fatal PE. And it is true for usual VT, and it is clearly true also for patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. The risk of initial recurrent VT event, including fatal PE, is clearly high in the first days and weeks of treatment when you give anticoagulant therapy for an acute VT. So when you have to start anticoagulant therapy for CAT, treat quick and treat strong. This is a rather old meta-analysis from the Cochrane Library. And you can see that we have to remember that if you choose unfractioned heparin in a patient where you can prescribe low molecular weight heparin, it was a meta-analysis of patients included in trials and with active cancer, the risk of death was 30% lower. In those patients will receive low molecular weight heparin for the first day 
of treatment compared to those who received unfractured heparin for the first day of treatment. For the extended therapy, we have many trials, and it was illustrated in this rather recent meta-analysis from the Cochrane Library that if you give to patient with CAT extended therapy with long recovery weight heparin without any relay with VKA, you will have a more efficient therapy. You will decrease the risk of VT recurrence by 50%. And the good information is that you will not increase the risk of bleeding. And that's why when we look at the recommendation from the European Respiratory Society and the European Society of Cardiology, the regimen proposed in the last version of the guidelines were long recurrent weight heparin as soon as you can give them for three to six months of a VKA for patients with acute venous thrombolism in the setting of cancer. So until very recently, the most strong therapy was long recurrent weight heparin without VK relay. In the past years, we were lucky to publish the results of several trials comparing direct oral anticoagulant therapy and longer care weight heparins in the treatment of CAT. I included in this table some of the trials, four of the five trials, and I let in black the two main trials, the two pivotal trials the Ocus IVT cancer and the Calravaggio trial. Please note that all this trial was openable trial, and this was also non-inferiority trials. Remember that the comparator was Dalteparin, and Dalteparin, when you give Dalteparin to a patient with CAT, remember that after one month of therapy, you will decrease the dosage of about 25 persons. Please note, that the primary outcome were not the same in the Okuzai cancer, the Caravaggio trial. And <clears throat> the Okuzai cancer VT trial concluded that a doxaban was non inferior to daltepirine for the treatment of cancer associated thrombosis on a composite outcome. And it was very difficult to follow this composite outcome. While for the Caravaggio trial, we were able to conclude that Apix7 was non-inferior to Dalteparin for the efficacy outcome and was also non-inferior in terms of major bleeding. Last year, we were lucky to publish the results of another pilot trial, the CASTA-DIVA trial, and we included in the publication of the results of the CASTA-DIVA trial an updated meta-analysis of all the randomized controlled trial comparing direct oral anticoagulant therapy to low molecular weight heparin in patient with CAT. And as you can see on the slides, it appears that in patient included in the trial, DOACs are more efficient than low molecular weight heparin, but are also associated with an increased risk of clinically relevant bleeding. So now we have trials and meta-analysis of trials, which give us the information that DOAX seems more efficient than low molecular weight heparin in the setting of these patients, but associated with an increased risk of clinically relevant bleeding. I am professor of therapeutics, and every of my students, when I ask him or her if he really read the paper and understood the randomized control trial. The next step is to assess if the results of the trial may apply in the patient we have in the clinical units. This is the external validity of randomized control trials. And we have to remember that if we give all the patient with CAT in this black zone, we will have those who were ineligible to DOAX randomized control trials. Unfortunately, those who were ineligible to DOAX randomized control trial had a high bleeding risk. 
They also very frequently have GI or GU tumors, genital urinary tumors. In some trials, we were able to include this patient. In other, we are not able. That's why it is just behind and between ineligible and eligible. We are not able to include patients with brain tumor, primary or secondary brain tumor. In some trial, we were able to assess eligibility for some blood cancer like lymphoma, but for some other trial, it was not eligible for the trial. And please note, it is in bold, that patients were selected regarding their renal status and patients defined as with severe renal impairment as defined by the Cockroft and Go formula were all ineligible to this trial. And so the question we have now is that, do we get and do we include the, in this trial a large amount of patient eligible or do we select it rather young patient with a rather localized cancer and rather usual VT? And it is, a very uh, original studies, and I'm very happy to share with you this result, which has just been presented one time ago during the ICTIC trial. This is the Mondial uh, Thrombosis and Cancer meeting. This is the international event, and it has been presented one month ago. So it is very, very novel. Bastien Petit, who works in our team, were able to do a multi-center cohort from Saint-Étienne, Paris, and Amiens, and to assess more than 300 patients with CAT. These patients were followed during six months, and unfortunately, one in three of them died during the six, six months follow-up. It, it illustrated that this patient have really a worse prognosis. And also that despite receiving anticoagulant therapy, 6% of them had a recurrent VT despite anticoagulant therapy. And also 6% of them had a major bleeding under anticoagulant therapy. And so we there go to the people and look at, okay, guys, is this patient a little to a direct trial or not. And unfortunately, Bastien demonstrated us that among more than 300 patients seen in clinical practice for an acute CAT, one in two would not have been eligible to a DOAC trial. And in one and two, we would not have been able to propose the patient to participate to one of the most important field, uh, trials in the field. So for one in two patients, we still need further research. The other important question is that thanks to the oncologist, patients with cancer now have an increased prognosis. And you remember that the mortality was rather high at six months, one in three patients was dead in the previous slide, but it seems also that Two, of, two in three of them were still alive. And for them, we do not have a lot of data. We recently published with Isabelle Maé in Paris, the SCAT trial. It was a multi-center court study of patients with SCAT who received at least six months of anticoagulant therapy. And we followed them after the six months. And we were able to find that unfortunately, for these people, the risk of recurrence despite anticoagulant therapy is still high, 8% after six months. If you continue with anticoagulant therapy, you will pay the cost in terms of bleeding with 5% of the people who will have clinical relevant bleeding. And unfortunately, you will still, still meet patients will die during the follow-up with the 30% of the people who will die during the follow-up after six months. And so for these people who survived to six months of anticoagulant therapy for CAT, we need to better elucidate the best management. 
And I'm very happy to discuss with you after that the APICAT trial, which is led by Isabel May for our French Innovity Networks. And in the APICAT trial, we randomized people to receive apixaban at the full dosage compared to apixaban at the reduced dosage. And we hope to be able to demonstrate in which setting reducing the dose of apixaban will be sufficiently strong enough to protect patients from VT recurrence, but also to decrease the risk of major bleeding in extended anticoagulant therapy for CAT. So thanks for the first part of this presentation. If it's okay with you, we would like to discuss this topic of cancer-associated thrombosis a little bit more regarding the regular doctors. Um, so we usually do a little patient presentation, if that's okay. So let's say a patient, a male, 65 years old, comes into the ER. He says that he's noticed some swelling of his right leg. Um, it's, it's feeling warm, it's feeling tense. He doesn't have any trouble breathing. His vital signs are okay. He doesn't recall having had any insect bites or um, an injury to that leg. But he does say that he has cancer, that he has lung cancer, which has been diagnosed a couple of months ago. So what should the young colleague in the ER do with this patient right away? This is a very frequent question and thanks for asking that. Clearly, our colleague will have to think about deep venous thrombosis. And we have two options. In the regular way, we assess the clinical probability and then we order d dimers But we also know that d dimers in the setting of cancer unfortunately have a decreased yield. We have very, very numerous D-dimers who will come back positive and then we have to order a CUS um, ultrasound. The other option is to go directly to the CUS and many colleagues in France, I don't know if it is the same in Germany or in Australia, does not propose D-dimers in the setting of patients with cancer and go through the CUS. If the D-dimers are below the threshold, you are able to rule out the hypothesis, but most of the time they are above the threshold. And then if the curse find proximal DVT, there is a clear indication to propose anticoagulation for the patient, clearly. And then, for example, the ax in this situation may be a very good option if the patient does not have any contraindication to the ax. If the patient have DVT but below the, the knee, it is distal DVT, the discussion may be different. In many cases, we can, in France or in Canada, propose, for example, uh, to anticoagulate this patient. But in other countries, they propose to do not give anticoagulant therapy, but to order a new CUS one week after that. If One week after that, without any anticoagulant therapy, the patient had a proximal extension of the DVT, then you will give anticoagulant therapy. If the patient do not have a proximal extension, you will be able to not give anticoagulant therapy. But to be honest, in a setting of lung cancer, and we will discuss that in some slides, um, I think that most of the case, the patient have proximal DVT, or most of the case, the patient will have an extension of distal DVT. And in most of the case, I will give anticoagulant therapy for the patients. Let's discuss another case. Let's say we have a patient in the ER who doesn't have any cancer, but we suspect DVT. Should we look for cancer in every patient with DVT? No. Clearly, we know since Armand Trousseau that um, occult cancer may be in patients with DVT or PE. But we also demonstrated with Canadian colleagues and our French network that extensive screening for occult cancer may help the doctor to diagnose more cancer, 8% after two years but it will not give patients an improved survival. And so at this time, uh, the Canadian friends 
assess a trial where people were randomized to receive very extensive screening. It was the some trials. And they conclude that if you do extensive screening, you will find more cancer, but without any positive impact on patient prognosis. And our French network did the same, but with um, TEP scanner. And we were able to find that if you use TEP scan for all patients with unprovoked VT, you will increase the number of cancer diagnosed, but you will not improve patient prognosis. So at this time, it is not recommended to, to do an extensive screening in this kind of patients. You mentioned that many cancer patients suffer from uh, DVT and VT and, and pulmonary embolism, so about one in five is affected, which is a very high rate, obviously. But then again, cancer patients are also a very heterogeneous population. There are patients that are young, otherwise completely healthy, and on the other side, we have very ill, elderly, frail patients. Is there a group where we should think about um, anticoagulation for primary prevention of venous thromboembolism in, in, in any sort of cancer patients? This is a very good point. Indeed, uh, this is a paradox, and I, don't, I will be very happy to have your opinion in your countries, but international guidelines recommend to discuss primary prevention in patients with lung cancer, with pancreas cancer, or induced with a high risk of VTE assessed by the coroner score. And all the international guidelines say, okay, guys, do that. But in fact, in France, no doctor give primary prophylaxis because it is not reimbursed in France. And also because we have a lot of difficulties to assess those who will really benefit from the intervention. Because in fact, if you give anticoagulant therapy, it will be to avoid VT, but it will increase for all the patients you give anticoagulant therapy, the risk of bleeding. And so at this time, we have some difficulties to really individualize the people and the individual who will benefit from prevention. So there is no clear group where, would, where you would also maybe give low molecular weight heparin in a reduced dose as we usually do in the hospital for high-risk patients? No, because being in the hospital is per se a very high period of risk. And this mm -hmm. is not the same when people are done at their home. Mm -hmm. I think the same is also true in Germany. Actually, we are not really working in this field of medicine, but my impression would be uh, that the majority of cancer patients who would meet these criteria from Corana will not receive prophylaxis, uh, despite this evidence or because we are afraid of bleeding. But again, we are not really working in the field of, of cancer. So uh, we are, it's so fascinating to, to hear all your uh, data on that. I would have one final question before going to nephrology, surely. So I never really understood this idea of reducing the low molecular weight heparin after four or six weeks, or putting it the other way around, if you say, well, in the beginning of the thrombosis or embolism treatment, you need a high dose and you go back then to a lower dose and you end with a dose, which is actually, in my understanding, somewhat lower than regular treatment with a drug, then it comes not really to a surprise that in the majority of the comparisons between low molecular heparin and drugs, you would have less bleeding with heparin, but also more thrombosis. Um, yeah, and it's explained because the, the main trial, which is the CLOT trial published by, by Agnes Lee in the New England Journal of Medicine 20 years ago, um, she were afraid of bleeding in this setting of patients. And then that's why they modified the drug regimen. It was not very strong in terms of evidence in the elaboration of the design, but at the end of the day, their trial were positive. And so this is the gold standard nowadays. So we've discussed how to manage uh, cancer associated thrombosis as regular doctors. Um, so how is it in patients with kidney disease? Could you tell us a bit more about that? You know, since this beautiful paper in JAMA 10 years ago, 
that having a renal impairment is a risk factor for developing VTE. And we also know in a rather sooner publication, data confirming that even in patients with cancer, having renal impairment is associated with an higher risk of VTE. So as nephrologists, you have to be aware of venous thromboembolism and even in patients with cancer, clearly. Some years ago, Martin Murgier, during his PhD in our research lab, demonstrated with the help of Manuel Montréal that pulmonary embolism is also a cause of renal impairment. Based on the definition of the CADIGO guidelines, we were able to demonstrate that one in two patients with acute pulmonary embolism had acute kidney injury. And we were also able to find that when we followed this patient under the anticoagulant therapy during the 31st day of treatment, the patient with acute kidney injury, one in three of them, had an higher risk of death and the more severe acute kidney injury was, the most high the risk of death. Why? And unfortunately, this patient also have an increased risk of major bleeding. So PE is associated with an increased risk of acute kidney injury and patient with PE and acute kidney injury have a worse prognosis than patient with PE and without acute kidney injury. So you have to remember now that pulmonary embolism is a cause to discuss in patient with acute kidney injury. You also know that unfortunately the acts involve the kidney in their metabolomics. And when you, we look at the axe pharmacology, we know that the area under the curve is modified in patient with renal impairment. And unfortunately, we did not include a lot of patients with renal impairment in our trials. For all the pivotal trial of DOAX in the field of VTE, less than 8% of the patients were included with a clearance as um, defined by the Cockroft and Go uh, formula below 50%. So we did not include a lot of people with renal impairment in the DOAX trial. In the trial of cancer, I will show with you this very, 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 very uh, soonly published paper with Cecilia Beccatini. It is a sub-analysis we did in the Caravaggio trial, and we want to assess if having a decreased GFR in the setting of cancer-associated thrombosis was also associated with an increased risk of bleeding. And exactly like outside CAT, we were able to demonstrate that patients with abnormal GFR had an increased risk of bleeding, whatever the treatment was, apixaban or dalteparin. But please look at the same analysis if we define renal impairment not with the help of 60 for the GFR threshold, but with 50 as the threshold. And you can see that at this time, the difference just disappear. How can we explain that? I think it is because we selected a population very specific to be included in this trial. If you give the definition of renal impairment with 60 of GFR as the threshold, you will have 24% of the population included in the trial as having renal impairment. But if you use the 50 threshold of uh, GFR to define the renal impairment, you will lose one in two of your people with renal impairment. And I think it explains why these results are interesting, but relatively frail. Now, this is the second time where I want please to hear me. Is it a nine or is it a six? 
Is it a severe renal impairment or is it not a severe renal impairment? We have a disagreement, but this is not a disagreement about which formula we have to use. And it was done by Judith Catella in our lab, uh, also again with the help of Manuel Montreal and all the Riete registry. And we took more than 4,000 of people with acute VT, with 20% of them having cancer. And we assess how many of them had severe renal failure according to Cockroft and Go formula, the one we use to select the drugs, or for example, the CKDAP formula. We are able to say that, okay, guys, more than 4, thousand of people had severe renal impairment according to Cockroft and Go or according to CKDEP. And we were able to demonstrate what you already know. The formula does not individualize the same people as having severe renal failure. One in two, 40% of the people defined as having a severe renal impairment was cured from severe renal impairment when you change the formula you used. It is a little bit funny, but for us, it is really important because all the guidelines ask us to follow the criteria of the randomized controlled trial to select the drugs. And the formula used for the selection in the randomized controlled trials is the Cockroft and Go formula. At the end of the day, we agree on one point. If the patient has severe renal impairment defined by the Cockroft and Go formula, or if the patient had severe renal impairment defined by the CKDAP formula, and if we have to give them anticoagulant therapy for acute venous thromboembolism, the evolution is not good. Up to 10% of this patient will have a major bleeding during the first three months. Clearly, this is a major issue for, new, for us. We have to give this patient anticoagulant therapy because they have acute VTE. But if this patient is defined with severe renal impairment, with Cockroft and Go, or with CKDAP, this is a therapeutic challenge because we will face a huge risk of major bleeding in the three first months of therapy. And then that's why with Patrick Mismiti and our French network, we have the chance to build the verdict trial. Unfortunately, Rupert Bauer-Sachs and the German colleagues were not able to participate and to help us to include the people in the trials. And in this trial, we randomize people to receive the initial good dosage of the ax because you remember it was the first educational message I want to share with you. At the very beginning, you have to treat strong and treat adequately. But once you add down the first initial therapy, we assess if a reduced dosage of the ax would do as efficient and as safe as the conventional therapy at the time of the beginning of the trials. This is the trials. The good thing is that we started the trials. The not good thing is that we stopped the trials at the end of past December because it was very difficult to recruit the, nine, uh, the 800 people who were expected. And I hope that we are able to provide results on the rather 400 people we are able to include in France. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very important discussion regarding the kidney function formulas. And it's maybe a, a rather naive question, but why are most of these trials using creatinine clearance? Because the kidney community, we almost completely abandoned using that and we, we only use um, GFR formulas. And we yeah, started I, doing that quite quite some time ago, decades probably. Yeah, I, I think that initially in the very preliminary trials, in those who assess low molecular weight heparin versus unfractioned heparin, 
it was the period where you, nephrologist, were telling to us, okay, Cockroft and Go formula is the best tool to assess renal function. Then we started to compare our strategies based on this selection and to not include patients with severe renal impairment. And then we add new compounds and these new compounds were asked to be compared to the conventional therapy. And as conventional therapy was assessed based on the selection provided on Cockroft and Go, despite you told us that Cockroft and Go was not a good tool to assess kidney function, as it was the tool we used to select people and not to assess kidney function, we were, mm, I have to say that prisoner from the, 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 the design of the pivotal trial in the past, and we were not able to change that. And you will see in two minutes that unfortunately, in the trial which we will do during the next decades, we will still use the Cockroft and Go formula. The other response is that we were hoping initially that Cockroft and Go was also a better predictors of bleeding because it included, for example, the weight. But as you saw in the previous study, in fact, Cockroft and Go help us to individualize patients with a higher bleeding rate, but not so different from the second AP. Uh, well, thank you. So <laughs> hopefully in the future, this will, might still change a bit because I think we will stick with our formulas in the future. Um, I get another question regarding the, the dosing, because if I read that correctly, the strategies differ a little bit. For example, in the Caravaggio study, apixaban was not those reduced in CQD patients. There were a lot of CQD patients in that study. While in uh, Hokusai a cancer study, the edoxaban dose was reduced. Yeah. So how does that come together? Um, what, yeah, because, how can we uh, orient ourselves? Uh, the Hokusai program started with the Hokusai VT study and then with the Hokusai cancer study. Edoxaban was the fourth dox to be assessed in the setting of acute VT. And then they learned from the failure of the previous compounds. And the edoxaban was the only one to prospectively assess those reduction strategies in patients with CKD. So when they finished the trial in acute VT beside cancer, they were the first one to go and to start a dedicated studies in the setting of cancer. And then based on their experience on sickly patients with those reduced strategies, they implemented the same protocol in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. When we did the Amplify study, it was the study of apixaban and the treatment of VT outside cancer, Unfortunately, we did not introduce an a priori dose reduction strategy in patients with CKD. And so again, we, was, we were a prisoner of this when we wanted to go to the phase three pivotal trial in cancer-associated thrombosis. And so that's why we are not able to include in the design of the trial a dose reduction in patients with CKD. And please remember the the paper which will be published uh, in some months with Cecilia Beccatini. In fact, the proportion of patients with real CKD was very, very, very low. 13 people, 13% 13 only had CKD as defined with uh, GFR below 50%. And most of them were between 40 and 50 uh, millitils mm -hmm. by minutes. For me, the clinical consequence is that I rather use apixaban in patients with advanced CKD and atrial fibrillation while in patients with uh, venous thromboembolism. I usually use edoxaban because I'm more convinced really of this idea of reducing the dosages, but surely we're looking forward to read whatever comes out of verdict. And thanks so lot for being so thoughtful about kidney function and these estimators. 
that's indeed much more thoughtful than most nephrologists are. It's much easier to go for the CKD AP estimator, which are on the left sheets. And for the cock of gold, you would have to go to the computer and do some 25 seconds or so of calculation. Having said that, surely the cock of gold formula is a very awkward formula from today's point of view, as you said before, but it takes into account, and that's also what you already said, it takes into account body weight. And this is when it comes to dosages of some importance, surely. I have one question or comment or whatsoever. So I, I have the idea that the medical societies who provide us guidelines are still rather reluctant to accept uh, drugs in patients with advanced kidney disease. So the European Society of Cardiology actually advocates against its use when it comes to venous thromboembolism in people with a creatinine clearance of below 30, whereas in atrial fibrillation, actually everybody accepts that drugs are much better than vitamin K antagonists, even though there is also no evidence uh, in this field. So is there any idea behind this? Uh, why these uh, societies differ in their recommendations? I think it's, it's a great transition to the last part. What do we have to do now? Then if we still stick to patients with CAT, uh, I presented you results from trials, but if one day, unfortunately I have CAT, I wanted to know if I will be more at risk of VT recurrence, and then if I would benefit from appeals, which seems to be more efficient, or if I am at more risk of bleeding, and then maybe I will benefit more from long recurrent weight tapering. And then we have to individualize therapy, and this is uh, difficult at this time. What we know is that it will depend on the type of cancer, and it was suggested by Sarah some minutes ago. We know I've published with Isabel Maé and Manuel Montréal, that, for example, the bleeding risk is the main issue when we start anticoagulant therapy in patients with colorectal cancer. Although in patients with lung cancer, the main issue after death is VT recurrence despite anticoagulant therapy. The other uh, issue we have to face to decrease the bleeding risk is drug-drug interaction. And the difficulties is that it is not very easy to do some research in patients or in healthy people with anti-cancer drugs. So we developed some cellular cells models and Ludovic Lafay in our group is nowadays able to find that each drug for cancer will have a safe or not safe profile of association with each type of anti of drugs, for example. And I will remember that for immune modulating agent, we also have some issue of dye dye interaction. Another very frequent issue is the association with antiplatelet therapy, because to be very brief, we know that patients with cancer very frequently receive antiplatelet therapy at the time of VTE, but we don't know how to protect them. We know that if we stop antiplatelets, the patient will have an increased risk of, for example, stroke, myocardial infection, or DVT or P despite anticoagulant therapy. But if we still keep antiplatelets on top of anticoagulant therapy, we know that patient will have an increased risk of bleeding. And that's why we are very lucky to start in France the bad VT trial. And I'm hoping that maybe some German colleagues will help us to respond to this question. It will be an open label randomized control trial who will compare a combination therapy of anticoagulant plus antiplatelet therapy and patient with cancer will be able to participate versus anticoagulant therapy alone. We will first have the aim to define, to demonstrate the superiority of anticoagulant therapy in the clinically relevant bleeding risk and to be sure that stopping the antiplatelet therapy in this patient will not expose them to an increased risk of vascular events. And finally, Gunnar, to respond to you, unfortunately, in the very severe disease situation, we just have 
paper and you send me this very, very recent paper. And this is not trials, this is retrospective analysis suggesting that some drugs may be a good option in this patient. Unfortunately, we lack randomized control trials. And that's why the European Society of Cardiology and the European Respiratory Society do not recommend at this time the treatment with drugs in these people because we need to increase the dosage at the very beginning of the treatment. And this is not the case in AF. And so we have a very high risk of bleeding and we are not sure that this is safe to propose that. Remember, in, if you give anticoagulant therapy for patients with AF, it is pro to protect them from the risk of stroke, for example. When you treat a patient for acute VT, this is clearly not the same goal. And finally, we have a lot of hope with a new target. We know that if you give fibronolytics to patients with acute VT, you will have the very higher risk of bleeding. If you give anti-2 or anti-10A, you will have a risk of bleeding, but lower than with lytics. And we are very, 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 very interested with the development of anti-11 inhibitors. Uh, this is a very recent paper we published. This is all the type of anti-11 we are developing. And please note that antibodies are not eliminated by the kidneys. And so we are starting two trials in the field of cancer-associated thrombosis. And they will compare to DOAX or to long recovery heparin to treat patients with acute VT in the setting of cancer. We are hopeful that this treatment will allow us to provide something as efficient as the drugs recommended nowadays, but safer than. Unfortunately, the company asks us to exclude people based on the Cockroft and Go formula, you see my lies. But on the pharmacological point of view, these compounds are not eliminated by the kidney, and maybe we will able in the future to assess the safety and the efficacy of these compounds in the setting of CKD. And we know that there is some trials with these compounds to protect people from catheter-related thrombosis in dialysis patients. And maybe, hopefully, in some years, we'll be able to prescribe these drugs with safer profile in patients with severe CKD. The last academic slide, which will be this one. I told you that thanks to oncologists, one in two patients with cancer will be cured from cancer. And this is great. Unfortunately, some patients will die from cancer. And we know that they will have a very high risk of bleeding. And I'm very, very, very happy that with Eric Klock, who works in Leiden, Netherlands, and Simon Noble in Cardiff, we just received 6 million of euros from the European community. And we will develop, I hope we will succeed, an application to help healthcare providers, doctors, and also patients admitted in palliative care and receiving anti-thrombotic therapy at the time of palliative care admission to help us to stop the anti-thrombotics and to avoid major bleeding in this patient. It is the Serenity Program, and we just have the fundings from the EU, and I'm very happy of that. So I know it is the most important part of the presentation. I'll just switch in French. Donc notre tour de France s'arrête à Saint-Étienne. On veut faire une petite pause. On veut se poser quelque part. Um, quels sont les lieux incontournables à voir, surtout en tant qu'Allemand ou Autrichien? So why will you love your stay in Saint-Étienne as German Australian vacationer? It all comes in one word, in one color. It is green. 
Okay, so Saint-Étienne uh, is a city of the Tour de France, and this is the carte postale of Saint-Étienne. As you can see, this is green. This is green, and I hate my German colleagues because of that. 40 years ago, we lost the final of the Ligue des Champions against Bayern de Munich. And during the match, our team, who fit in green, hit at two times the bar and the post. And the match was in, was in Glasgow. And as you can see, the bar and the poles were not round. There was what we still call now poteau carré. It was scare. And so we all in France are convinced that if the bar and the poles were round, Saint-Étienne would have won the finals. Unfortunately, it was Bayern of München who won the, the final. But as we are in France, we love the one who lose. And the day after the finals of the Saint-Étienne team was received in Paris. This is the Champs-Élysées with a huge Marie Humaine. We still have the square poles. They are presented in many of the parts of the city and some of the bars, some of the restaurants are called Glasgow or Potocare. And this is one of my, of my son. And we are lucky to go in the stadium, but this is amazing people and amazing moment to live. We also are green as design and hearts. We are a city of design as said by the UNESCO. We have the luck for having Le Corbusier. And if you are very interested in architectures, will, you will be able to see this church. And the interior of the church is only with the light of the sun. And this is just amazing to see that. We also have the Cité du Design. And each two years, we have a very famous international meeting about design in Saint-Étienne. And we also have many museums and with some very, very interesting moment with my son was, uh, for example, Le Vague, which is done by a very famous uh, artist from Saint-Étienne. This is like Rome, a city with seven hills. And this is very great for cycle. We had a huge industry in the past, and it was the city where all the French bicycles were done. And then it was also the city where most of the people love to do cycle. But this is not bicycle like in Germany, for example. There is a huge mountains or huge fall to the sea. And for example, last month, there was a trail. And you can see that you were able to climb to mountains and then to go back to the river. And if you go to Saint-Étienne and if you like, to do bicycle, you will be able to go through the forest. You will go be able to climb the mountains with a very beautiful Chateau de la Loire just behind, you can see. And you will be also able to have some castle just in the middle of the Loire, which is the main river we have just near Saint-Étienne. And then if you did a great job, if you had sports, you will be able to see the last treasure, green, last, la, uh, green as grapes. And we are very lucky to have great wine yards. You will be able to drink, and this is maybe the most important reference from the presentation, some saint Perret or some Saint-Joseph from François Villard, of Cotrotti from Yves Cuiron. All this as just near Saint-Étienne. And the last one, my prefer is Sainte Mon Amour. Sainte being the diminutive, the short name, the nicknames of Saint Etienne. And I was very happy to have this discussion with you all now. And if you have some questions, I will be happy to respond to them. So thanks a lot. And I'm sure you're not the only one who does not like Bayern München. There are quite a lot of uh, colleagues also here in Germany who are somewhat bored of them and of their ever winning in, in German. So sorry for that. Apparently, it's not a good year this year to remember some football matches between France and Germany. There was something else happening 40 years ago in Sevilla, uh, yeah. which I dare not to mention here. Some other 
German Austria football matches 40 years ago. That should also need not be mentioned here. But anyway, um, apparently French soccer took now the lead and now we are kind of envious of all the successes you had in the last years and decades actually. This was fascinating. Thanks a lot for this tour d'horizon in uh, CAT. And we learned so much and we are so proud that you do all these studies. And uh, this is a general impression, uh, that's actually just my last word on that, that you are really in France much better than us here in Germany in doing all these clinical studies. This is the same in nephrology. This has been the same in the last three years when it comes to COVID-19. So apparently all around us, people are much more either eager or willing or able to do these clinical studies. So thanks a lot for doing all this because unfortunately it's not done here. We hope to see you soon again, maybe in one or two years, uh, to, to discuss the results of the now ongoing trials. And surely we're looking forward to see these novel treatment strategies, these factor 11, uh, which are so promising, particularly in the field of, of nephrology, even though for us it's still somewhat magic or whatsoever that you would have a drug that reduces the risk of thrombosis while not really inducing bleeding risk to such a great degree. But we are happy anyway that these drugs will come to the market. It's a little funny to see that they will come to the market in the same year maybe when the traditional dogs lose their patent protection. So only so huh? So thanks a lot. Hopefully the next football match will be won by Saint Etienne. Many people in Germany actually again would be happy to see Bayern be beaten. <laughs> and uh, see you hopefully soon again. Thank you. Bye.